Welcome everyone to the Polarian series of webinars. Today's presentation, Industry's Best Practices on How to Achieve DO178C Compliance. At this point, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Andy Holton. Andy Holton is a professional services engineer with Polarian Software and has been with us since 2011. He focuses on supporting our customers' implementation and best solutions to their problems, leveraging Polarian's highly flexible open architecture. Andy's expertise at quickly identifying and translating customers' requirements and their nuances have served him well in working with many enterprise organizations across a wide range of sectors, including automotive, oil, and aerospace. He keeps a particularly close tap on the latest developments in agile and hybrid development best practices and how they pertain to ALM. Andy studied material science and engineering at UCLA. I'd like to welcome Andy to our presentation today. Hi, thank you very much, Nancy. As was mentioned, my name is Andy Holton. I'm a systems engineer with Polarian Software. And today's presentation is on industry best practices on achieving DO 178C compliance. Before we get started, just a little bit about Polarian for those of you who are unfamiliar with us. We were founded in 2004, and in 2005, we released the first unified 100% browser based ALM solution. Um, since then, we have 10 years of focusing on bringing some of these benefits to our customers, including real-time collaboration, easy-to-use intuitive UI, and, and really full traceability. This is one of the big ones. We have 200, over 250 Fortune 1000 deployments, 2.5 million users around the world, over 200 extensions in our extensions portal, and over 15,000 registered community members on our forums and on our message boards. Polarian has a global presence, not just our own company, but through our reseller partners as well. Um, we are present either as in personally as a reseller partner or a customer on all six continents, and we do have a large number of reseller partners in other countries, as well as a large number of technology partners around the world. In addition, our customer base is very broad and very far-reaching. Uh, we have customers in from pretty much every industry that makes something, uh, from aerospace to automotive to medical, um, and even to, to pure software and pure service companies as well. Let me get started on our agenda today. In the beginning, we're just going to talk a little bit about DO-178C, what the history of it, and a brief overview of the standard. And then we will go on to a little bit about managing processes. For those of you who have some familiarity with the standard, uh, you'll know that DO-178C doesn't really specify any specific processes. So we'll talk about how to manage the process so that we can sort of fit with the, the requirements that we have. We'll talk a little bit about, in general, how does ALM help deal 178C compliance. What is the point of having a tool like Polarian when it comes to creating aerospace software and, and getting being in compliance? We'll talk a little bit about Polarian's DO 178C solution itself. We have a template that, that brings a lot of the information from the standard into Polarian and, and really helps jumpstart your, your efforts in uh, working with DO 178C and getting compliance. We'll do a brief demo of the tool itself and of, of the template itself uh, near the end, and at the very end, as Nancy mentioned, we will have time for Q&A, so any questions that you have, we'll, we'll try to answer at that time. Again, a little bit about the DO-178 history. Uh, the DO-178 standards were created around 1980. At this time, there were there's sort of two things going on. One, there were, there were a few major aerospace accidents that I think really sort of started to push for more safety, and in addition, Again, this is about the time when embedded software was becoming much, much more prevalent. Um, the amount of embedded software that we have today versus when the first jetliners came out is, is enormous. Not just avionics software, but also entertainment and things that you wouldn't necessarily think are mission critical, but still have to be within compliance. The predecessor of DO-178C, DO-178B, this was really the standard aerospace regulatory document in the United States for 20 years. Um, not just the United States, but really around the world. This was sort of the, the gold standard. It, it remained untouched for a long time. But recently, uh, the FAA released DO-178C just to clarify a lot of the language, a lot of the objectives within the standard. You'll see a lot of companies advertising solution for DO-178B slash C. And this is really because the two standards are not that far apart. Um, there's just some clarification. There's some more specific language within DO-178C. But the two are not significantly different. All right, so a little bit of the timeline. One thing I wanted to point out, as you can see from here, is that DO-178 was really the very first, one of the very first functional safety standards. 
A lot of the other ones, IEC 61508, ISO 262, for other industries, These, a lot of these were built not really off of DO-178, but with it in mind. DO-178 really sort of pushed or sort of defined what functional safety in, in some of these embedded software solutions are. So you will see two things. One, if you ever have to use one of these other standards, you'll see a lot of stuff from DO-178 in there. And in addition, you will see there is a lot of things that we can take from what has been done with these other standards and bring them into our application of DO-178, um, especially things like ISO 26262, which have been very, very well developed in terms of the processes they use and, and how they do their, their risk management and things like that. A lot of that we can bring back into our application. Starting with the overview of DO-178, one of the first things that is done is the software that you're, that you're developing is classified on one of four design assurance levels. So we have catastrophic, hazardous, major, and minor. Catastrophic would be something like flight control software. If you're a fly-by-wire aircraft, if you're, you know, if that software stops working, right, it could cause a, a major loss of life, loss of aircraft, um, so forth. Hazardous would maybe be a little bit of a step down, maybe, maybe autopilot software in, in certain ways where if your autopilot stops working, now your pilots have to fly by hand for much longer than they anticipated. And then major and minor. Again, minor may be something like entertainment software, where if the entertainment system stops working or has a problem, there's no effect to the plane, but it causes some discomfort for the passengers. But the big thing, the big takeaway here is that each level, so D, T, D, A, requires meeting an increased number of objectives. And there's a, a few parts to this as well. One is that the more, the higher level you are, the more you have to track, the more traceability you need. Um, and there are some other objectives such as independence that you have to meet as well. And so you can see on the right here, this is sort of the trace diagram for 178. It has all the different artifacts you need to trace, all of the traceability between the artifacts that you need, as well as exactly what the objectives or the activity, what the reference is in the specification. But you'll see for A, for level A software, you have to go trace all the way down to your uh, executable ob object code. So not just the source code, but the actual file that's being put on your hardware to be run. Whereas if you are a minor system, right, you only really have to track your, your system requirements, your software high-level requirements, and then the test cases that verify them. So there's a, a, quite a bit of difference of what you have to track, what you have to trace between the levels. One thing you'll, I think, is, is great to take away from this diagram on the right is a lot of what DO-178C is about is traceability, creating the artifacts and linking them together. And we'll talk about that more as we go along here. What it really talks about in the specification is what outputs you have. So what are your, the documents that you need? What are the outputs that you need to document your processes, to report on your traceability, to report on completion of objectives, um, and so forth. And you'll see a lot of that, a lot of 170C is really outlining exactly what documents you need and what you need to be in those documents and what you want to be showing to your auditor to, to make sure that you're in compliance. Part of that is going to be the creation and tracking of specific artifact types. Um, and you'll actually see there are artifacts that are laid out in the specification that you must track. Um, again, going back to the, the previous slide, things like system requirements, high-level, low-level software requirements, software architecture, test cases, and so forth. And these are enumerated within the, the standard for you to track and create. Again, sort of with the same one, or the one above, the traceability of these items. So how do all of these items exactly relate to one another? For example, how do my test cases how are my test cases linked to my requirements? Which test cases verify which requirements? And which, you know, what, what source code is being fulfilled by, or what source code is fulfilling which requirements, which high-level requirements are being refined by lower-level requirements? So how all these things interact uh, with each other? And what we'll see when we talk about a little about ALM is that this line right here, this is really the hardest one um, when, when you use sort of a manual system. And so we'll talk about why ALM solutions really key in on this in order to make your process a lot easier. Um, and then the last thing is independence of verification actions. This is only true from, for some design assurance levels, but what this means is that there is a requirement within the standard that if one person writes the requirement or one person, I, actually I believe, if one person writes the requirement, someone else has to write the code and someone else has to do the testing. Right? So you can't have the same person writing my requirement and doing the testing. And it, it's just there to ensure that no one is no one's doing anything underhanded, first of all, but also that you're not you have two different sets of eyes that are working on the single requirement. And then within the standard as well, uh, they actually supply a checklist of objectives and related activities. So basically things that you should be doing 
in order to produce the proper output. However, DL 170C does not address specific elements. Um, it doesn't address how the artifacts are tracked and created. It doesn't specify specific tools and doesn't specify specific processes for activities. Right? So what this means is that there is nothing in there that says you must use an ALM tool for DL 170C. Right? I could do it within Microsoft Word if I were, really wanted to. As long as I meet the objectives, I could do it on scratch paper. Same thing with how the artifacts are tracked or the tracked or created. Right? I don't. There's nothing in there that says you must use an Excel document with one row for each item, or there's nothing that says you must use a Word document where each paragraph is a single single requirement. But again, we'll talk a little bit about why ALM is such so good for this standard, and a lot of it comes down to creating and tracking the items in a much easier way than using Microsoft Word. This last line, though, this is really. I think the most interesting part, because it doesn't specify any specific processes. There's things you have to do within the process, and there's things that you have to do to document your process, but there's nothing in there that says you must use vModel, you must use Waterfall, you must use Agile. Um, and what we're seeing, again, not just in DO 178C, but across a lot of the, the industries that are regulated by these standards, is that hybrids are sort of coming in place in processes where people might be using Waterfall with vModel with Agile all in the same project. And the last thing is that even though that there, even though there is a list of a checklist that is made available as part of the standard, compliance is not judged on the, the checkbook. Or the, oh, sorry, compliance is not judged on the checklist. Compliance is really judged on the whole body of the work, and it's really up to the auditor to say, "All right, I see everything I need. I'm good to go." And that's the thing that to, to remember is that even though you may have checked off every single one of those items on the checklist, you may still not pass, or you may need to do additional work. So it's really up to you to, to make sure that you're doing everything the way that it's supposed to be doing, uh, for the most part, in order to get compliance. Again, going to sort of my favorite part of this topic, uh, talking a little bit about managing processes. Again, DL 170C does not specify any specific process. Again, I must document it. I must meet some, I must meet some requirements in my process but processes may be different for each phase, right? So I may have a specific process for specification. I may have a specific process for development. I may have a specific process for testing. And again, as I mentioned, a lot of these items, so Waterfall and Model are some of the more traditional ones, but even Agile is being brought into aerospace development and, and development of lots of embedded software at different points in time, right? So one of the things that an ALM tool can do as well not just the tracking, but be able to sort of unify all these processes together. Like I said, we can use a lot of the other functional safety standards for guidance. I've done some work with ISO 26262, and there's some stuff in there that is a, a quite a bit, quite useful when it comes to thinking about DO 178C in terms of how they design the processes, how they specify things must be done. And one thing I think is very interesting is, and one thing I sort of learn to look at every time I talk about one of these regulated processes is, how do things map to the V model? Because regardless of what sort of sub-process you use, if you take the whole general idea, everything can be mapped to this V uh, in one way or another. And to be honest, it really should be, just because the V model is, in my opinion, the best way to ensure verification of all your requirements, right? And so we can do the same for DO178. We have all of our artifacts that we can map to the different branches of the V, right? So we have our system requirements, we have our software requirements, our design, software architecture, our software design, all of our coding and implementation tasks at the bottom, and then all our test cases up the right-hand side. And then we can actually take all the documents that DO 170C requires us to have, and we can actually map them to the V as well at the different stages. We have a software requirements document, software design document, software design plan, and all, all that information directly on here. So regardless of what processes we're actually implementing, it's always helpful to think about it in this manner. Because what happens when we go on to our talking about the, the process at in individual phase, what we can do is start doing things like applying the V model to our specification phase, right? So especially if I'm doing a lot of software modeling um, and I'm doing a lot of sort of design validation before I do my verification, I can run my, create my requirements, create all my lower level requirements and do my validation and modeling well, within my one branch of the, the bigger V, right? And then what we're seeing a lot is that while that's being done, we can actually have an agile process going on at the development level. One of the great things here is that because it is agile down at the bottom, right, as things get changed on the left side, they can easily be sort of implemented into the, the shorter sprints of agile during the development. And then on the right hand side, maybe it's just a straight straight waterfall, just you know, going back up the, the other branch. But 
the, the key here is as long as the processes are documented and as long as they're giving you the proper, the appropriate output, it doesn't matter too much what the specific process is that you're going to be using. Having an ALM tool really helps two things. One, coordinate all these processes together so that you know, you're not using one tool for your ISO development, one tool for your requirements management, and having to sync with them together. Having them all in one tool allows you to have that seamless transition from vModel to Agile. And the second thing, it does help ensure that you have the specific outputs. Um, one thing we'll see with the, the template is that in Polarian, we've created all of the outputs that you need to have. Um, so it becomes very easy, regardless of the process you're doing, to go through and say, all right, you know, put, let's put my information to my document, let's export it, let's send it off. We've talked a little about this in the previous slides, but I want to talk really more in depth about why ALM? You know, what is the point of using an ALM tool when things like Microsoft Word and things like Microsoft Excel are, are common and ubiquitous at pretty much everyone's workplace? And there's four key parts to this. Uh, one is managing the artifacts. The second is establishing traceability, documenting and enforcing the processes, and integrating certified tools. And, you know, again, all these things can be done with the traditional methods. They, they have been done in the past, right? You know, ALM as a tool set is fairly recent when you look at the whole scope of aerospace software. However, one of the big concerns when you have Word documents or when you have Excel documents is how, where, where are your artifacts? How do you know that you have them? How do you know that you're covering all the ones that you need? Um, and one of the things that tools like Polarian do is that they bring everything together in one centralized repository. Um, so all of your documents, all of your artifacts, all of your requirements are in one place, and it becomes very easy to search for them, very easy to find them. And in addition, it allows you to do things such as have the entire history of changes throughout the, the life cycle of the, the, the project, right? So I can see every single change that's made to an item. Stuff like this gets really hard to do when you are looking or using sort of not spe non-specialized tools, things like Microsoft Word and Excel. Um, so just being able to keep all your documents together, search through them all, find the information they need, make the changes, have very parameterized information within there, all becomes a lot easier when you are using a specific tool. In addition, once you have the artifacts within the system, and once they're sort of individual artifacts as opposed to monolithic documents, it becomes much easier to trace your items. Right? This is just an example of sort of how we've seen, seen things done uh, with people who come to us for help. A lot of times they'll have a, a Word document and there'll be a, a table or a line within there that says, all right, this requirement is verified by test case number one, two, three, or, you know, document elibrary.xls row seven, right? Something along those lines. And that works until something changes, right? I add another item in there. I delete that test case. I change the number in schema, and then it no longer is valid. And I have to go through and I have to manually create the links all over again. Um, in addition, if I want to create, say, a trace table, right, and that's actually one of the things that is specified in India 170, is you have to have some, some of your trace, you have to have your traceability data in there. Creating that manually is quite tedious because you have to go through, you have to find, all right, for requirement five, these are the test cases, and you type them into Excel, and you have to do that for however many thousands of work or requirements that you have. And so with an ALM tool, right, it, it becomes easier because those linkages are no longer manual, right? I create the link manually, but once that happens, it is permanent um, until you delete it, of course. And no matter where I move the item, whether I rename it, whether I change it, that link always stays intact. Because of that, it becomes very easy to query those links and be able to build these trace tables automatically. Uh, and that's really one of the things whenever we, we dem do demonstrations for customers or, or for prospects that they really say, is the, one of the things that helps them the most because it saves them a lot of time when they're trying to put together their audit packages and make sure that there's not as many mistakes or, or very, very few mistakes in the trace table. Lastly, sort of within the tool, because specifications like 178 do not specify a process, if you, it can be hard to document a process or your process or whatever process you're trying to follow in order to show that you're, you're actually complying with it. In addition, sort of on the other hand, even if you have a process, even if you have a, a you know a 300-page binder that documents every single step of your development process, how do you really prove that your process is being followed, right? Someone may say that you've gone through the specific approvals that you need, but how do you prove to the other that yes, we actually went through the approvals that we need? And again, with a tool now, all of that can be built in. So not only documenting the process and actually building it into the software. 
Um, as you see here, there, this is just a transition matrix that we have that shows exactly what are the transitions between steps in our project. But oh, we can also put it in a for enforcement so that when you do go to the next step, certain actions have to be have to take place. You know, X number of people have to approve an item, or I must have certain information in here before I go on to the next step. Or even things such as, in order for me to mark my requirement as valid, or validated or verified, I must have a test case linked to it that was not executed by the same person who wrote my requirement. Right. So there's there's all of these different things that we can do with the enforcement of the process in order to prove again that the process is being followed and that the process is then self self documented. And the last thing, this is sort of goes a little bit away from actually using the tools, but in turn, one of the biggest benefits of using the ALM tool really has to do with the other tools that are out there. You'll see that, and I'm sure all of you know, not there is no one tool that is good for everything. Right? There's no tool that does requirements management, mo software modeling, source control, task management, test case management, test case automated test case execution perfectly. In order to get the best of everything, you have to go out and you have to find specific tools for each each area. And there's a lot of great tools and there's a lot of tools out there that are certified or have a lot of experience specifically for aerospace or for automotive or for whatever whatever industry you are in. And these tools create a large amount of artifacts. You know, a, a single test case may create a hundred runs or a thousand runs even if you are testing it every day. What ends up happening is if you have these disparate tools, how do I make sure that my test cases are getting linked to my source control, my, uh, my requirements are getting linked to their models, how, um, and, and bring them all together into that sort of framework so that I can see everything and everything gets sort of put onto the appropriate portion of the, the process chart as I need. And that's really where one of the big benefits of ALM comes in is that, and this is actually a, an idea that was told to me by a, uh, a colleague of mine. We were at a, an automotive conference, but what ALM is, is ALM is that V. ALM is what controls all the artifacts. The artifacts may be generated outside, so I may be bringing my requirements from somewhere, my coding tasks from somewhere, my test cases from somewhere else, but ALM is really what controls and stores and organizes all of that stuff. Um, so having that centralized tool there really helps with ensuring that everything gets put in the right place, everything gets brought all together. Now a little bit about Polarian's DO178C solution. Uh, we've created a template for our software that includes a lot of the required DO178 uh, things. So we have all the requirements artifacts are already, already predefined within the system. We include templates for all the output documents. So that there are your plan for software acceptance criteria, all your verification plans, software requirements documents, things like that are already sort of brought in and templates have been created for those. So instead of having to create them all, you can simply come in and start entering, entering your information. Um, that also helps with just checklisting items to make sure that you are getting all of your outputs correct. What we provide in the template is a very basic V model structure. Basically, what we have sort of created that, that V scaffolding, as we showed before. But one of the nice things with Polarian is that even though the template we're providing you doesn't implement any other processes, it is very easy to implement processes for specific outputs or for specific artifacts. So my, again, my coding tasks may be a different process than my requirements, which may be a different process for my test cases. And the last thing, again, one of the, the biggest benefits of ALM, biggest benefits of Polarian, is that we can, it automatically generates certain traceability tables and independence. So we have independence reports in there that show when I have a requirement that is verified by this, verified by a test case that has the same assignee. And I also have all my trace tables from my requirements trace tables. I have trace tables from pass to code to defects, and also trace tables uh, verifying your requirements to test cases. All right, and so here's just a brief overview of the artifacts and outputs that we have within there. See here on the left, we have all of our DO-178 artifacts within here, including this DO-178C requirement. And actually, one thing that wasn't mentioned here is that within the template itself, it does we do provide the DO-178 checklist as well. And these are artifacts within the tool so that you can link tasks that, that help satisfy those checklist items within Polarian, and you can actually link them directly to the artifacts that they specify that need to be created, for example, or send hyperlinks to the trace tables that need to be created. And so that's what this DO-178C requirement is down here. But we create, we have all the artifacts within here. We have all of the linkages and traceability that you need. So again, going back to that flow chart that we had at the beginning, these are all the linkages between the items. And we have all the documents and all the reports that are needed in order to meet DO-178C compliance. 
again, meeting these items don't, does not necessarily mean that you are in compliance, but it, it is a very good step in order to be able to start with and refine your, your work and your outputs. Now, the last thing, again, is not really so much about Polarian, but Polarian does have a large number of integrations that are available, uh, things like VectorCast, MATLAB Simulink for modeling, and so forth. And so we have a large number of integrations that's already cr uh, created, as well as a large number of extensions just to the tool, things like being able to trace the specific lines in code. That's an extension that you can ha that you can you can get if you want for Polarian. But in addition, we are very, very open. One of the things that I like personally best about Polarian is that Nothing within our tool is closed off. Our API and data structure is completely open so that if you wanted to write your own integrations, write your own extensions, you are more than happy to do so. And we do support the REC IF interchange format now. And this just allows us to exchange your information with other ALM and requirements management tools in a very efficient way. So you can even do your requirements definition outside of Polarian and use Polarian simply for the ALM structure. All right, great. At this time, I'm going to go into a sort of a, a short 15-minute presentation of the tool itself. We'll just go through the, the DO178C template, and we'll t show a little bit about what are some of the, the items in that template. So this here is Polarian. One thing you'll notice is that Polarian is a fully web-based tool. So there's no client-side applications. There's no sort of client to install. Simply go to the URL that I want that my Polarian server is located at, um, and it takes me directly there. Um, and this page here is simply the getting started page, and this is where we have all the information about what is contained in this template. Um, again, a lot of this is from the slide before, but we have our work items, our link roles, our workflows, and our documents and reports here. And, and so this is all the information, and this was taken directly from the, the standard uh, and brought into Polarian for this template. And it really, again, we're not saying that this re replaces the standard, right? We're not, we don't have all the, the detailed information, although some of our customers have sort of taken this template and made it their own where they actually put in a lot of information from the standard as well. So this is this is all moldable for yourself, but this is really just a starting point to start my work. So for example, I go to the plan for software aspect of certification. What you'll see here is we have a template for the documents. And again, this has the, the sections and the information in here um, and the descriptions of the sections from the, from the standards so that instead of having to create all these items from scratch yourself, you simply come in here and start entering the information as it as it asks for it. All right, this is true. We have quite a few other ones, problem report templates, you know, software development plans, and so forth. And a lot of these documents, what you'll see is a lot of these documents are simply documentation, right? These are documenting the processes that you have in place for your development. What can be done with Polarian is that there are a few extensions out there that can actually take your workflow and embed it directly within the, the documents themselves. These are not things we included with the template because they are they do require you to install an additional extension, and we wanted to make the template basically as uh, as broad as possible, so anyone could use it regardless of what they have installed. But if you wanted to automate some of these documentation processes, there are there are tools that can definitely help with that. Now, one of the biggest things here is let's go to software requirements data. One of the big benefits of Polarian over, say, Microsoft Word, and you know we talked about, and everything so far that we talked about in terms of documents is just basically replacing Microsoft Word. But with Polarian, we can actually embed requirements and what we call work items, uh, which are any individual artifact, we can actually embed these directly within the system or directly within the documents. So what you see here is DO99, sample system requirement. This is a requirement, but it is contained within the document itself. If I go ahead and open this up, what you'll see is that it is an individual item. Um, it does exist on its own, and it will be able to link to another individual item. And you actually see here, DO99 is linked to a lower level uh, sample high level requirement. If we go in and click on that, we can drill down to that one. Right? And if we want to go down even further, we can go down to our sample low level requirement. We can go down to our sample software architecture, and then even down to test cases and code, or the change request, sorry. We'll go down to test cases, defect, and so forth. And so we have that full traceability, but at the same time, we have the requirements within the document. And the best part about this is it eliminates a lot of the double work. I don't have to create my trace matrices and have to create my documentation documents separately. I simply create my documentation requirements. I say, here is a new system requirement. I authored document. And I save my items. And again, you see it's easy to author them. It's easy to create them, but they do all exist within the document but as individual items. Um, and that's the biggest benefit of using a tool like Polarian, that you have that sort of best of both worlds, individual artifact tracking, 
and w within documents as well. And you'll come again. We'll come and see through here. Uh, for example, where's my? Let's go to software quality assurance plan. Again, we can put our test cases directly within here as well, or we can just do our plan. And we have all the different documents. So here we have our software verification cases and procedures. And you see here we actually have our test cases embedded directly within here. Now, when it comes to actually linking the items together within our from our from one document to the other, it becomes quite easy. So no longer do I have to go through and, and find the, the test case that I want and type in the, uh, the ID of that test case. I simply come to the requirement that I want to link. I click on, actually, let's create a brand new test case here. Great. New test case. So once I have the two items that I want to link together, instead of having to go in and type out the ID of the item, I simply click on the link, and then I choose the link rule that I want. And again, remember that there's different link rules for different items, um, just because DL-170 specifies that your traceability has to be done in a certain way, right? And so in this case, there's only some certain link rules that can be applied to a test case. In this case, we're going to do the verify, verifies link rule. We'll come to our software requirement, and we'll click on the link icon again. And that is all that is needed to do to be done to link the items together. Once this happens, it doesn't matter what I rename this test case, doesn't matter what I rename this, this requirement, these two will be linked together for all time until I, I decide that I want to delete those items. And now I have, for example, the system requirement with one test case here. Now, if I wanted to create one, a brand new item directly and have it linked directly, simply click on the plus sign, and I can choose which items I want to uh, create directly. All right, and so there's several ways of creating and linking items, but regardless of how you do it, it never the link never gets broken. It's there, it's queryable, I can find information. And again, I can go down all the way down here. Let's open up a different item. From my system level, all the way down to, for example, source code, uh, my code work item here. Now, this code work item is a little bit sort of tricky because this doesn't actually store the code, but I have a section down here called linked revisions. Um, and this is one of the things within Polaris that makes it very powerful. We can inter we can connect with several different source code repositories. So I believe right now we have Subversion, Git, Perforce, and there's one other that I can't remember quite remember the name of right now. But regardless of the uh, repository used, you can actually link specific specific commits to a requirement, to a piece of source code, to a task. So when I do make a change to implement a, implement some source code or I make a change to correct a defect, within my IDE, I can actually simply enter this ID, so in this case, DO108, and have the item linked directly to, have the change linked directly to my work item. Um, and the same thing with our, some of our extensions, being able to link specific lines in code to the source code or to the, the work items as well. So, so we have not only traceability throughout the artifacts, but we do have traceability all the way down to specific pieces of software code. In addition, again, if we have to go down all the way down to uh, function execut executable object code for those design assurance level A pieces of software, all of that can be stored directly within the repository as well, and you can link directly to that file. Now, we've done the linking here. We've sort of established that. In addition to the documents, we do have several reports in here, um, and some of them are as simple as the DL-178C process objectives. And so this is simply all of the process objectives, all of the items that are within that DL-178C checklist. What's great about this is that when I have the item here, this is a work item itself, just like a requirement, just like a test case. So I, actually, I could actually come in here and link other items directly to this, uh, to this item. So I could say that this item is verified by, or is implemented by a specific test case that is related to another requirement or so forth. And there are all the references directly within here as well. And what some of our customers have done is actually taken this and actually put in the information that is specific for this objective. Um, so they actually put in a lot more information in here. Uh, this template, when we when we created, was designed really to be used side by side with the reference document, but some of our customers have taken it even a step further. Um, in addition, we do have things such as requirements trace data. So this allows us to trace all of our items all of our system requirements to our high-level requirements to our low-level or software architecture uh, requirements. In addition, we have our test case trace data. Actually, let's go to test results trace data. What this shows is the linkages from our project requirements to the project test cases, and then finally, what the results are of those items. So whether it has been uh, tested, whether it's passed, whether it's failed, and what test run uh, it was most recently tested in. 
And we can do this across not just a, a few levels, but even across several different uh, levels of traceability. And again, what's great with this is if I go ahead and create a brand new item here. So let me go ahead and create a new high level requirement. I create it in here. What we'll see is that it gets automatically inputted into our trace table. So no longer do I have to go through and manually update my trace table every time I add a new item or I create another linkage. All I do is I create the item, I create the link, and all of my trace tables, regardless of where they're at, get updated. So we see here arrow 248 has a high level requirement. Now this link to it, arrow 250. And then again, this will be true here. And it'll be true in our other requirements trace data as well. This, is, uh, this query is looking for something slightly different. No, it's just the wrong link rule. And that's a good point is that the link rules in Plurian can be queried. So you can look for specific link rules when you're doing these queries. Now the last one, last report here is the independence report. Um, and the independence report at this time does not have anything in it, but it does show when I have two items, uh, it's the parent work item and the child work item, that have the same assignee. So this just ensures that anytime you have a parent to a child, um, and that most, most of the cases are going to be requirements and test cases, that they're not assigned and not being done by the same person. So let's go ahead and go back to our presentation here. That's sort of the end of the demonstration. And again, just before we go on, these really are the items that we strive to achieve with Polarian um, for DO-173 and really for any regulated environment. Just being able to track all your required artifacts with some granularity. Even though they are in documents, they are their own individual items, and I can link them together. It allows you to really insert your process. So you, you may have noticed I didn't really talk much about the process within our, our template, and that's because the process we have is very, very basic. If you were to use the template, you would probably want to put in your own process, change the workflows so that that meet your meet your needs. And so, however you insert it, it ends up being self-documented. It does ends up being self-enforcing as well. Automatically generating and completing, automatically generating complete and accurate chase tables again is, is one of the biggest time savers. Um, no longer do I have to manually create the tables; it just sort of happens once I do the linking. Being able to use and reuse these output templates, so they are there for you. You can actually change them and save them as your own templates if you want and be able to reuse those. And then finally, just being a, place, a point of integration for all the best of breed tools that are out there for testing and artifact generation, code design, and so forth. One thing that we, we haven't really talked about uh, so far is that Polarian really strives to be a very flexible solution as well. And so everything you've seen here mostly focuses on the R and the QA side, but we do have the full ALM solution along with the requirement management license and a QA license that allows you to be very flexible in terms of what license you choose and what you're doing within the tool while still getting the benefit of the full, um, the full product. We also have a lot of user-driven patented technology. So this is a lot of technology that we've worked with our customers um, in order to, sorry, in order to uh, develop the best tool possible for them. So some of the things we haven't really talked about but are available in terms of being able to import from Microsoft Word, export to Microsoft Word, and then finally having the live docs where you have a document with the work items directly within them. Now, uh, before we get on to the QA, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this is going to be the end of our uh, presented information. Uh, the rest of the time will be mostly just answering the questions that have come in. Uh, but I do sort of welcome you to visit Polarian.com if you want more information. We do have a large number of product and tutorial videos online. Uh, so if you want to see more in depth on how to do specific items. In addition, there are uh, either a downloadable 30-day trial or a pretty much unlimited online trial that you can go ahead and use if you want to get sort of get your hands on. Or please feel free to contact us to request a demonstration or proof of concept. We'd be very happy to put together a more personalized presentation for yourself. And again, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I believe Nancy has a few words to say, and then we'll get into the Q&A. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. There's a few questions in the, in the Q&A panel. Either you can answer them directly or I can present them to you, however you'd like to proceed. Uh, Nancy, I can, I can uh, answer them directly. So the first one, I like the block diagram of traceability for different levels in the overview slide. Are these slides going to be available after the webinar for us? We can definitely provide you with the slide deck if you'd like. Uh, feel Just reach out to us. Um, and we can we can send that to you. Um, in addition, I actually got that slide from the uh, from the Wikipedia article on DL once you see, but um, all the references where all the information and all the diagrams have gotten from are within the slide. So we can send that to you as well. Um, second question: Can I make SQL queries to Polarian? Yes, with a caveat. Uh, the SQL layer within Polarian is, is simply a reporting layer, so you can query information from Polarian, but you are not able to uh, input 
or change the tables, uh, the SQL tables in Polarian. So, well, you can, but it doesn't make any difference to the data itself. It's simply a reporting layer. But if you have, um, if you have some Perl scripts to generate reports, um, if you have other reporting tools that you need to get and use SQL to generate the data from Polarian, um, you can definitely do that. Polarian can be queried either internally through the Lucene query or externally through a, a SQL layer. What about performance? It seems a bit slow during the demo. Uh, yes, and I do apologize for that. Our demonstration platform is really where we go to mess around a lot, to be honest. And so the performance is not, never as good as it, it should be just because we have a lot of stuff running and we have a lot of things that are not quite optimized on our system. But uh, we have customers who have thousands of projects and millions of work items on there with you know 500 plus employees logging on daily. Um, they have no no issues with the performance. Um, they they have they see no real performance hits even with that large uh, of user base. Um, another question: Does DO178C prescribe any workflows or specific review approval statuses? And if yes, is this contained in your template? Again, from my understanding of DO178C, and, and this is going to be true with a lot of the functional safety standards, is that there is no really prescribed work. You have to have specific outputs. So it's more about specific outputs that you've shown that. You've things have been approved properly, or that you that you show what your process or your workflow is. Um, not so much that you have to do it this way, but that whatever way you're doing it, it has to meet certain criteria. Sure, but it also has to be documented. And that's what sort of I was mentioning at the end there, where the the process that we have in place in our template is fairly, I would say, broad. Um, it's not very structured. Um, it is usable, right? So if you were to use the template out of the box, it would provide a a, a good workflow for that, but any workflow that you have can be brought into the template and used. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, no, DLNC doesn't really describe any workflows, just some requirements for the workflow and how to document the workflows. All right, uh, so I do not see any other questions, uh, Nancy. Uh, no, I think that's great, Andy. All right. I want to thank uh, yourself for uh, making the time for the presentation today, and certainly thanks to all of you who took the time out of your busy day to join us. And again, I encourage you to visit. Plarian at www.plarian.com. Thanks very much.